Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad you're here this afternoon. I'm John Langs, and I'm the Artistic Director of ACT Theatre. I first want to take a moment to acknowledge that ACT Theatre sits on the land of the Coast Salish people, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it, including the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. They are this land's first storytellers in whose footsteps we walk. Well, our story this afternoon begins in the before times in 2019 when ACT was introduced to the good people at Trial and Error Productions. They are a Seattle-based company with the mission to support astonishing artists. And with a strong overlap in mission, the two companies came together, ACT Theater and Trial and Error, intending to launch a series of workshops and readings in order to give support to the incredible community of local playwrights. And then COVID hit. And we had to take a step back from presenting these readings in public, but the work on the plays has and will continue in a series of workshops taking place over Zoom. And that means that when ACT Theater can start to share stories in person again, we will come roaring back with a series of public readings and hopefully a full-throated production or two by some of these fine local contemporary playwrights. And here they are. My name is Holly Arsenault. My name is Andrew Lee Creech. Hi, I'm Keiko Green. I'm Brendan Healy. Katie Forgette. I'm Montaigne Aurore. My name is Yusuf El Gindi. My name is Kirsten Potter. There's some fantastic playwrights in this city. There's actually a ton of them. I think that it's time that we paid a lot more attention to the talent that's here. It's, it's hard as a local playwright to actually feel like some of the bigger theaters are, are listening to you or giving you a shot. I think that there are so many really talented people here. It's what we've always been asking for, and so it's, it's really exciting to me. I love the fact that ACT and Trial and Error Productions is doing this. We have the audience, we have the intellect, we have the artists. For some of us playwrights, I think it'll be a great opportunity to get in front of a different audience as well. There is something distinctly different about the energy of an audience who loves to come to new plays. I think it's so incredibly valuable for established theater audiences to be reminded of where theater comes from. I'm so excited. Yeah, I just, I always get a charge out of watching that little video. Um, we're halfway through this, this uh, what we've laid out for ourselves this year in terms of plays. Uh, eight eight uh, workshops and all four of them have been completed. Um, and the work is just remarkable and excellent. And the courage of people to continue writing even in this time when we don't know what's next has been um, amazing to be a part of and, and humbling. Um, this afternoon, we have the pleasure to spend some time with two artists in our Seattle community both of whom happen to be leaders of different theater companies. Desdemona Cheng, the co-artistic director of Asiatrope, has stepped in to direct a play written by Brendan Healy, the co-managing partner of Pony World. I'm a huge fan of both of these artists. And this afternoon, I'm sure you're going to see why, as they're here to share some of their journey with you and to discuss Brendan's new play, Mangrove Park. And at the end of the conversation, you will have a chance to ask your own questions. You can just drop them in the Q&A drop box below and we'll get to those questions at the end. And finally, this afternoon, I just wanna call your attention to one other slide, which is an encouragement to donate. Now you, our community, you've always been generous. And with all that's happening in the world, I believe that the art that we make and the stories that we tell ourselves are more important than ever, so please. Join me in donating to ACT Theater so we can continue to give our full support and energy to the great work of these artists. Thank you so much for considering that. And here now are Desdemona Chang and Brendan Healy. Hello, Des. Hello, Brendan. I'm so glad you guys are here today. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation, and I hope you are. Uh, I'll step out, have a great time. I'm here if you need me. We've got people behind the scenes if you need us and uh, have a great time. Thank you so right. much. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Hi, Brendan. Hey, <laughs> Mona. Hi, I feel like one of the few benefits of being in COVID times is to have deliberate time to sit down with fellow artists to talk about the work. So it's, kind of, it's a great joy to be here with you. And I'm so excited we finally get to work together. I know we've been, we've been trying it for ages. 
Uh, it's just, it's never worked out with calendars. I mean, you are one of the busiest directors in town. I mean, you're all over the country. Uh, so this was fantastic to kind of get the opportunity. So uh, yeah, I, just, I actually wanted to start by thanking ACT and Trial and Error Productions, and of course you for putting this all together. And so really excited. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to just launch off the conversation. I feel like you and I, as John had mentioned, um, we share a kind of uh, a kinship in, the, in our identities as leaders of small professional theaters in town, as well as individual artists. And I also realized, um, I think in the last hour after we had just chatted, I also realized, I think you and I also share a really unique position in that we both um, lead a company that operate under a co-leadership model. Right, like we both run yeah. like Bumbrit theaters, um, yeah. and I think that's like a rare thing. I don't know, maybe, the, maybe and, and so part of me wonders, like, how did that come about for you? How did you start Pony World? You're also the founder and you're the co-managing partner. So I'm wondering, like, what is it that launched this institution for you in your in your heart and your mind? Well, and you're a, a founder of Asiotrope too, um, co or or sole? Uh, we are co-founders. Co-founders. Cool. Uh, well, Cody World Ice uh, co-founded as well uh, back in 2009 uh, with a uh, terrific person named Jennifer, uh, Juniper Barrelsheimer. Um, but due to uh, starting a family and different life trajectory, she left the company pretty soon after. And that first show that we did uh, is where I met Sam Hall, who then became eventually the other co-managing partner. And at We've worked together ever since. Uh, she's fantastic. Uh, we're a pretty collaborative group, I'd like to think. Um, and so the, we started off by doing nothing but original work. That's changed over the time, but we used to just build our own stuff exclusively. So it was always very collaborative in that sense. So having a collaborative leadership model just seemed organically to make sense. So we, even though we have two people that are like Comanche partners, I mean, that basically means that we do the grant work and the unfun stuff. When it comes to like deciding what we do and how we do it, it's, I think it's really a group, group effort. Yeah. And was your, was your original co-founder also a writer, writer director, actor? Like what, what did Actor, you... primarily. Yeah. Very similar model. So Richard Winslonaker and I are the co-founders of Asiatrope, and Richard is an actor, and I'm a director. And... Um, I, can't, I don't know, I guess it makes sense, right? That you want to have a co-founder that is not the same job as you. <laughs> so it's actually not a competitive leadership model. <laughs> right, right. No, I think yeah, you complement each other that way. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were, um, you know, classmates in grad school at UW. And uh, I think we were, you know, on the cusp of graduation. And um, we were was just trying to figure out a way for us to keep working together. And I think it's always that thing where, well, no one's hiring me, so hell, I'll hire myself, right? So right. these companies always start off as like a vehicle to launch, launch our own work. And I wonder how that's changed. Because I think certainly I feel like as my career has evolved over the years, um, I mean, how do, I, how do you balance your own freelance life and also your obligations to the institution, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. I, you do so much work. I'm sure that you actually, we might have, uh, mirror opposite experiences a little bit because I started Honey World uh, similar to what you said like to get your own work out there right this was no one can say no to you when you're making it yes so uh, that was sort of the impetus and then over the years uh, Honey World Theater has really uh, it has grown and it demands a lot of focus and I actually spend a lot of time producing it was supposed to be on my playwriting it was really the beginning of it and now I spend a lot of time producing and we're doing work by uh, playwrights from all over the country, other local playwrights. And we still do some of my work, but it's much less often. Um, yeah, so that, that's definitely been a change right there. One of the things that we were in conversations about was the Christians that you had done. Was it 2017? Uh, no, just last year. I mean, oh, it so feels like it was three exactly. years ago. So uh, a bit further back than that. Um, <laughs> Well, there was, there was earlier stuff. I definitely know there was earlier stuff yes, that we had talked about and we had looked at the calendars. Um, I mean, actually, I've been trying to work with you for so long. I remember, I don't even remember what year it was, but it was several years ago. Uh, it's probably been ages since you've had the time to do 1448 or been in town when it was going on. 
but I think it was, it was only one 1448 festival where we were both in the roster. Mm. And I just remember thinking during that morning when the directors pulled the playwrights, I just remember thinking, <laughs> that's, that's oh. the and I, I, I don't even remember who I got. I'm sure they were marvelous. They always are. But it was yet another missed opportunity that we can hopefully make up now for. Now we're here. Right now. now we're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's just interesting. I mean, 1448 is such a, my God, it's such like, it, it feels like an adrenaline shot to the gut, right? And then you're like doing beer keg stands while you're, <laughs> while you're doing it. There's, I don't know, I, I'm such a fan of 1448, and yet I feel like, I'm like, do I have the stamina for this kind of work? <laughs> I so I'm, I'm getting older. It gets a little bit harder. I think that's uh, I of- saved the cake stands for the final night. It's hard to do a cake stand and then go home and write a play. It's, yeah. 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 And so, I mean, I, I play writing. I, I so admire all the writers out there for, for I mean, I mean, right now during this pandemic, my goodness, how are you, I mean, what is your inspiration right now for staying artistically, I guess, um, fed, you know? You know, for... A long while I really wasn't. It was it, when we had a shutdown. We were mid production uh, over at Pony World on um, a play called What We Were. When everything happened, we had a shutdown, and then the world shut down, and everything just seemed awful. It was really hard for me to be creative. I don't know if you had that experience, but trying to stay focused. Yeah. The <laughs> the act of creation is inherently optimistic, right? Yes. And I wasn't feeling a lot of optimism right then. Uh, but I'm getting back into it, obviously, hopefully, <laughs> as we do, uh, we do a workshop soon. And um, I, I have been getting into it more, and it, the, the more I've had to do it, it actually has become a solace. Mm. Whereas before, it was sort of a stress, like, how, how do I try to create theater in a world where I don't know when theater is going to exist again? But once you really get into the act of the storytelling, then it becomes therapeutic. Right. I feel like there's, there's like, <laughs> there's like making theater and then there's the logistics of having to put a theater piece up. Right. And yes. I feel like oftentimes I get so boggled down with the, the kind of the fussy mechanics of like, all right, I mean, of course we need money, we need space, but that's not why I'm in this. I'm in this because I want to tell stories. Right. right? And, um, yeah, I, I, I totally feel you in this time of how do you find inspiration? How do you, and for a while, I, I mean, when all this happened, I was actually, I mean, Aziotrope has been on, on a bit of a, we've been dormant for a little bit, um, partially because both Richard and I are, and our, our, I mean, we can talk about producing models too, once we get into that, but our producing model is really unique because we actually don't have a season. We don't mm. announce seasons. We don't have anything slotted. And it literally is, as inspiration strikes us, as we find a play we both love, and then we produce, which means for some years we do nothing. And sometimes we'll do like two, three projects in a year. Um, and it just has to do with whatever, wherever the impulse is and wherever, where, however things line up for us. So at the time when all this happened, um, we were, Azeotrope was kind of at a bit of a, 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 we were kind of in hibernation, you know, and when all this happened, we were like, oh, we should do something. We should respond to this moment right? I feel like there's a pandemic happening. There's a second civil rights movement happening. Like we should do something. And, uh, and we had a conversation and I think we should have another conversation now, but this was back in like March and April. Um, we literally thought, I think maybe now is not the time for theater to be like waving its hand right now. <laughs> right. And maybe that was just me being like afraid or tired or, I don't know, grateful for the space, but um, we, we consciously chose to step back and let other, I think other institutions who are better at handling these conversations to be amplified. And we, we just mm-hmm. were interested in being a bit of a silent bystander in this moment. I think now that things have somehow um, recalibrated, we might try to be more proactive, you know, I don't know. I, I, don't know, I don't know how you felt when, when all this happened with Pony World and, and what your kind of I mean, the re-entry process has been like, or re-entering still, we're not even, we're not done. Yeah. I mean, there's, I was talking to John about this actually not too long ago. It's interesting how I think when theater eventually comes back, 
right in the beginning, you'll see uh, a burst of shows that were the pre-pandemic shows. Yes. And and it'll feel like nothing changed, right? Because we were all uh, mid-production or pre-planning and those artists will still want to do that work that they love, they were excited to do, will explode with that stuff. But soon after, I think you'll see the effect of this time that we're in now, you know, with the pandemic, as you say, and the, the new civil rights movement we've been in, and obviously the election, and all sorts of stuff. Yes, yes. And it's creating yes. a chrysalis that I think you will see us emerge out of that with something different than what we've known before. I think, I hope. I think so too, right? And it makes me also wonder, like, how are we thinking about our programming, right? Um, how, do, how does Pony World plan their season? Or what, what, what are the rubrics you use to pick the pieces you want to produce? Uh, I mean, there's, there's really no set model we use. We, we always make it up as we go. We're mm-hmm. very disorganized that way. <laughs> we, uh, we don't have the structure. <laughs> we, do, we don't do like a full season, but we, it sounds like we do it with a bit more regularity than ASEO Trope. Right. We do, historically, we've done one show a year. Mm every year, not always, you know, 12 months apart, sometimes six, sometimes 18, but it ends up in a calendar year once a year. And then last year we decided to up that ante and we got into two shows a year. We were planning on continuing on that trajectory. So obviously the pandemic, so we'll see what comes out of it. But a lot of our decision-making basically comes from what is the passion in the room at the moment? Mm. Who has, that thing that they that is driving them to create and as i said in the early days that was always stuff we did ourselves but that's exhausting yeah it's really exhausting and to do it well takes a lot of time so we started to introduce uh scripted pieces i think our first one was um uh we are proud to present a presentation uh that which is a, just a, a raw dynamic script right it's just really intense and and wonderful and now we do more scripted pieces than we do original pieces but we still do the original pieces and we we had 2020 2021 was supposed to be the years that we're going to be reintroducing that new work um well i guess we'll see what happens really do you feel like the piece you were in mid-process piece when all this went down. Is that piece that's something you feel like can viably continue after, given this break and given where our, the zeitgeist of society is, right, like socially? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah. Um, it's a play that in, in and of itself maybe doesn't address those burning things that we've been feeling and talking about in this moment, but that doesn't mean it still doesn't have import. And it was, it, it was a team of almost entirely women and a women identifying artists uh, from the cast through the stage production team and directing team and, and production and design team. It was like 95%. And those are voices that are definitely important. And those artists I know like just love that piece. So passion will always be relevant. Yes. Um, so there's no way I can say to those artists, well, you know, your, your passion is, we're just going to set that aside for the moment and then reevaluate. I think we have to honor the commitment that they made to the work um, at the same time that we evaluate what are we going to do after that and going forward. Yeah. How about, how about you guys? Um, we, Easy Trips mission has always been, not always, I would say we arrived eventually at a mission. Um, when we first started, it was just whatever Desmond Rich wants to do, we'll do that play. Um, and over time, it took a little bit of um, self-interrogation, conversation, nights of drinking <laughs> to figure out why are we picking the plays we pick? And is there any rhyme or reason other than, right, like being a little more deliberate about taste and why certain things appeal to us. Um, and we have eventually arrived at the idea um, or, or the realization that, oh, we were interested in, in telling stories that weren't being told. Right, so our mission is to make visible, to make the invisible visible, um, and that somehow feels, I mean, not pretty tangential to a lot of what's what's going on in the world right now. Is really folks who haven't had voices should have a platform to tell their stories, right? Um, and th- and I think for me that's the hardest part because for me that implies I have to know what I don't know, mm-hmm. you know. Um, 
I think that's why it's oftentimes challenging for us to find a piece that resonates and also fulfills the mission because oftentimes what we have to do is like we're looking for writers who aren't produced um we're looking for communities who aren't telling who who, who don't have um a platform for storytelling um and i think that's that's hard because theater has its own unique pipeline its own social circles um and again it just goes out it goes, it goes back to i just i just can't fathom being outside of my <laughs> my own lens. Um, and then at the same time, right, the question of, like, oh, am I the person qualified to tell this story? You know, we did mm -hmm. a production of sound um, back in 2015. That was a co-pro with Act Lab. And that was a play, I think to this day, is my proudest production. And I think, I don't know, I'm not, I, don't, I think Richard might agree with me. Um, because we were entering into communities that we didn't understand. Like I didn't, I didn't, we, I knew very little about the deaf community, about deaf culture, but um, Howie Sego, who was a friend of mine, you know, was, is an actor. And um, we co-directed this piece together that was ASL and English. And for me, that sort of, um, I don't know, really cemented the mission of what we wanted to do. And I think since then I've been trying to not replicate, but capture that same, uh, that same feeling of, oh, new friends. <laughs> new friends yeah. who have stories to tell that the theater has unknowingly excluded in its legacy. Who are you? Where are you? I only have theater friends, <laughs> you know? I'm ashamed to say I mostly only have theater friends. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to, trying to meet people outside of our circle, especially right now because there's a friggin' pandemic happening. Um, it's, tr it's tricky, it, it's tough. And I feel like, I mean, also right now, we're all trying to do that too, right? Everyone's, everyone wants to diversify, everyone wants to um, reach out to marginalized folks. So I think there's also that happening, um, which is its own other, I guess, conversation. But um, yeah. I think it's, it's been tricky for me to find a piece that I feel like truly still, it, it's, it's still like nailing our mission We've had a lot of plays come up around, oh, topics aren't being discussed. But I think in, in a weird way, as the world gets better, my job gets harder, yeah. you know, which is great. It's which is great, but it's still like, ah, oh, my job is getting harder because people are like, people are getting better about this. Yay. But boo for me. <laughs> I love what you said about uh, how you look for um, making the invisible visible. Is that how you phrase it? I think I, I yeah. think I'm paraphrasing yeah. poorly. More or less. That's what, yeah, essentially it. All right. How can we how can we shine a light on the things we don't see? If 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 we think that theater is a representation of life, right? Yeah. What parts of life are we not representing on stage? Well, I love that idea about how you choose a show because I think that's at its heart. That's when theater is at its best. Is when it, it's showing you something that you you didn't know, but once you see it, you recognize it. Right, it's, it's what was invisible, but still familiar. So we're not, yeah. we're, you know, we're learning as we watch and as we create about other human beings, but we see ourselves or things that we understand in the, these new things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, finding the, the, those connections of commonality, even in, in those things that we didn't know were there before. I like that. I just had this conversation with somebody around why certain plays strike us as universal. Like, mm. oh, August Wilson, he's so universal. And I'm like, no, dude, he is so specific. Mm. So specific. And it's because his specificity is so clear and so authentic that we have the, and, and our innate humanness, right? Our capacity for empathy and his specificity makes me feel like, oh, you wrote this play about this, community of folks in Philadelphia that I have no context for other than it feels like Chinatown to me when I watch it. That's what he mm. was. And, and, and I think because of that, it hits me in a way that I, because in the end, we're all just selfish humans and we just think about ourselves. So everything relates to me. <laughs> but I think that's kind of, I think, I think we oftentimes use universality in a way that implies and I want to be careful because I think it implies that it's vague or generalized or like broad when in fact universality comes from a really, really intentional specificity. Right. Well, I think the, the key word you used there was empathy. 
mm. because maybe things feel universal once we can empathize with it, even if it's so different. Like the given circumstances of Wilson's plays are extremely specific. You're right, but people watch them and they can empathize with these things, which are different from their given circumstances. Is that the thing of empathy maybe gets the the words we use are imprecise and it feels universal, but it, yeah. it's just because it we can actually relate to this thing that we thought was very different than us. Right, and we still have a connection to it. Right. Yeah. 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 That kind of makes me want to go to Mangrove Park right now. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> I know, because now, now I'm talking about because because that play is actually quite specific where you said it. And I, okay, before we should back up and let the folks out there, um, can you give us like a couple of a, a quick plot? plot sure, sure. I mean, I know we're still working on it. So who knows? Oh, yeah. Things might change, right? We have yet to have our workshop but things might change. And so the playwright reserves the right to change his mind. <laughs> and I change it all the time. I mean, I sent you a confusing assemblage of an attempt at a draft a couple weeks ago, and it's changed so much even since then. Cool. So uh, I think if it'll, it's, yeah, constant metamorphosis. Um, but the, the, the general synopsis stays more or less the same, so I can at least give that. Uh, in just, you know, broadest strokes, it's a play about uh, four characters. At the center, you have uh, Maita and her boyfriend, Nat, who live together in a, a trailer park in Florida. And uh, there's the neighbor, Valerie. There's Nat's father, Jude. And due to various circumstances of unwilling or unable to evacuate, they end up going to ride out a hurricane in Maita and Nat's trailer for one long excruciating night um, and can they come together can they form a community can they survive uh, in a corporeal sense in a you know spiritual sense that's what the play that's the story of it cool how did you what inspired the piece for you i mean i guess questions i have so many questions on that right like first and i and forgive me because i actually don't know your bio story why florida and why that trailer park community? No idea. You know, there, you know, there are sometimes uh, you start with a, a new idea for a play and the core of the idea is very clear. You obviously have to write two hours of dialogue and figure out all of the nuance, but you know, it strikes you and say, oh, this is the circumstance and this is the story and this is why uh, they have to be. This is what that story is going to be. And then there's other times when you just sit down and you get an idea for a little snippet of a dynamic or a conversation and it seems fun to start writing and you start there and the next you know three months later you've got 150 pages and you got to figure out what the frick to do with it and this is one of those plays it, it started with a moment um, that is still technically in the play but has changed so much so many times it's almost unrecognizable from what it first was and it was just a conversation between these two characters, Maita and Matt. And somehow it just kept going. And then you added more characters. It, it was never, I never said, I was like, I'm going to write about Florida and a hurricane and four very different people trying to get together. It, it, that's, it found its way there somehow, God knows how. Can I ask what the conversation is? Oh, it's, it's that moment where, um, Maita thinks she's talking to Nat. It's at the very top of the play. Huh. She's supposed to be uh, still sleeping in. And she's trying to get him to wake up while she's making coffee and getting ready for work. And she's just talking to him about mundane uh, stuff, everyday stuff. And then she gets into talking about more important stuff just as she's talking to him and thinking that he's uh, maybe hearing or sleeping, subconsciously hearing. And then out of nowhere, he just walks in the front door. She has no idea where he's been. She's been talking to herself the whole time. And they get this big argument about where the heck have you, I've been talking to you this whole time. And why are we talking to me? Because I thought I was asleep. And that, it was that moment. Cool. That's so interesting. Because it actually becomes, the play is actually so much beyond, right, as you said, it's so much, it's so much more than what that is now. That is so cool. I just, I mean, I love hearing stories about the genesis of plays, right? Sometimes for some people, it's like a newspaper clipping or it's, you know, 
I've always wanted to write the story about this person. And I will say like, you know, I, the version I have is still, as you said, um, under construction, yeah. but I'm so taken with your voice as a writer uh, it, and the play itself. And the, it's so character driven for me, even though I know that you've written some significant like catastrophic events, like a hurricane, um, there's a lot of surviving and a lot of plot stuff. But for me, there's something that's just so clear about who these people are. And the dialogue feels so organic to me. I think, I don't know, it feels like an actor's play. You know, some scripts you read and you're like, oh yeah, actors would love saying these words. And I feel, and I have a hunch that when we get into the room, folks will love saying these words. That's very kind of you to say, and I desperately hope you're right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very nice of you to say. Um, yeah, there's, there's certain, like I say, there are external forces in this play, and there have to be plot points. There, there is a hurricane. You obviously have to establish that. How is it they can't leave that they're all together? You have to establish that. Um, but beyond that, it is hopefully a relationship play. It's about these four people and their history and their dynamic and those uh, plot points about just, you know, the, the reality that you have to, I have to say, when I write, those are the things I hate writing the most. I'm just, you know, I, I want to get past the exposition, you know, just can't the audience just know so I can focus on the people and how they talk to each other. But unfortunately, that's not how story structure works. You actually have to get through that. I mean, it's so funny because I feel like whenever I read like any of the great American classics, right? When I read like an Arthur Miller play, I feel like the Miller three act, the first act is just punishing because it's so dull. But then you get to that third act and it's like, holy wow, it's all, it all pays off. But I usually have to, I mean, it's hard. Playwriting is so hard, but I feel like, I mean, <laughs> Mr. Miller, that's his, that was his like structure. But I, that whenever I'm like, ah. Oh, don't give me that first act where it's all exposition. I didn't feel that way though with, with your play. Um, I think there was a delicate balance of what's necessary and yet what is still kind of sparkly and fun. There's a, there's a raw like humor inside of it. It's like this really dark humor that's persistent throughout. Um, but I think for me is, uh, uh, appeals to me tremendously. That's like my, that's like my jam. Dark comedy is my jam. <laughs> it is, well, no, I. I uh, the first show of yours that I saw that you directed was Jesus Hot B.A. Train. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that was the first one. I mean, talk about dark humor. The way that show starts off with the guy trying to pray and mm -hmm. the, the expletives that pour forth <laughs> is was just hilarious. And, and yeah, it's, I mean, that's that play. Talk about dark humor. That is, that exemplifies that, right? Uh, uh, that's also so much about like, survival right there's something yeah. about the way humor so complements people in dire situations right and i think in mangrove park too you're talking about a people a community of folks in a trailer park who are trying to survive a catastrophic uh natural catastrophe um when did you start writing this play i started it on a lark uh in early in early spring 2018, I think. Okay, so it's been and in the then, cooker. Sorry, what? It's been in the cooker for a while. Like yeah, this. well, I, uh, there's a, a reading series that got started that year um, called The Scratch. And they were having their inaugural little uh, workshop festival they were doing that year. And so uh, I, I, you know, they asked for proposals. I, I tossed them in Anger Park, even though I only had like two scenes of it. So within, within three months, I wrote the first draft, which is may, maybe for some people that's not fast. For me, that was extremely fast. Mm. And then we had a reading and I was just exhausted by it because of the intensity of that three months of trying to write a, you know, a, a full play in that period of time. And then I, so I just set it aside mm -hmm. and I didn't look at it for a year plus. And I just kept thinking, I should get back to that thing. There, there was a lot, there were a lot of problems with that thing, but I still hope that there was uh, something to mine from it, that it was salvageable, that it was worthy of some, something. So getting the chance to do this with ACT and Travel and Air Productions, it's a real gift because it's forced me to sit down and really find what in this thing uh, might be important or, or uh, that 
I can sandwich out of it, turn it into something. And it's been another exhausting, but really terrific process so far. And that's even before I get in the room with you, which is really what I'm looking forward to, you and the actors. I think once you hear it, you will learn so much, you know, right? That moment, like, did you haven't, you haven't, other than the initial, right, the, when you wrote it back in 20, did you hear it out loud in 2018? We did. We had like, I think literally, we had a, th a three hour rehearsal before we did the reading. And there was some confusion uh, about where we were going to be rehearsing. So uh, two of the actors went to a different place. So in the end, we had like an hour and a half or like two hours. So uh, it, it was uh, very abbreviated, but, the, but everybody involved were real champs and really generous. So yeah, I, I've heard it and it, it was a very educational reading, mm -hmm. but it's, it's changed so much that even, even the scenes that are at the core, structurally speaking the same, there's hardly a line of dialogue that's the same. Oh, okay. So when we get into the room next week, uh, I really will feel like I'm still hearing it for the first time. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Right. Um, has the pandemic affected your perspective on the play? I'm thinking about a, a play that centers around survival and containment and right and like just like devastation and like what what and being kind of forced into a space that you can't escape and I, and I just can't help wondering like oh is this in this is this moment of isolation like affecting not just how, but like the way your characters are functioning in the play. I think a little bit, consciously or unconsciously. I think I understand them a little better now, even though the, the threat that we face feels a little more abstract. Mm -hmm. um, the virus is obviously very real and very dangerous, but it, it feels just a little bit more removed than a literal hurricane beating down on your home. But I still think I've learned uh, and understand them a little bit better, which hopefully will help me write them better. I can definitely tell you in the earlier version, there was no reference to toilet paper. There is now at least one reference to toilet paper. I mean, the, the things you learn about uh, scavenging for supplies on short notice, mm -hmm. if nothing else, I, I did learn a bit about that. Right, batteries, toilet paper. Yeah. I guess you wouldn't have any kind of like flour shortage, you know, but. Um. <laughs> right, right, you know, they're all baking. It's a hurricane, it's a but they're all baking all the time. <laughs> Those, 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 those home ovens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what they're fighting over, the all-purpose flour. Here's a big bag of it, they just keep fighting. Yeah. Are, are you working on anything else right now during COVID times? Uh, yeah, sort of. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I was supposed to have a show done that got canceled because of COVID. Uh, Map Theater was going to be my play, City of Presidents. Hopefully that... Uh, might still happen once we get back to theater. But in the immediate term, uh, the one thing that Pony World does have going on is next weekend, uh, a week from tomorrow, uh, a previous show of ours called Suffering Incorporated that we've done a couple times now, we did in 2011 and 2016. We took an archive recording of it uh, in 2016 and that will be streaming through the Northwest Film Forum. So people can get a chance to uh, it won't be live theater, but if people wish, they can get back into uh, seeing a bit of theater for a weekend. And it'll be available for three days. And that first night on the 23rd, uh, we'll actually have a live Q&A with some of the artists, which I'm really looking forward to because some of these people I haven't had a chance to, to talk with for quite a while. So it'll, it'll be a good, fun catching up too. Cool. I think we have like a snippet. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Here have we Speaker, Irene, New Life Capital. We boldly settle all the important problems. You give me 2300 and in one week I'll make 20000 for you. There's a man with a large mustache and small abilities. A certain great philosopher recommends jumping off the roof. Hmm. And your wife? Happiness doesn't live in money. The money is gone. I know. Let's talk business. Let's talk business. Let's talk business. One must portray life not as it is, not as it ought to be, but as it appears in our dreams. I have to say, 
I love seeing theater that's not like the crazy master shot from the back of the house. Did you, how did, did you, did you edit that together? And was it like multiple shoots over the course of several performances? Well, I, full transparency here. Uh, this is sort of a master shot from the back of the house. Once we actually stream it. Oh. Uh, yeah, we put that, that trailer together. We, we had these grandiose visions because that show, that show up until last year was our most successful show we'd ever done. And it was, it was something that we owned. You know, we'd have to deal with anybody else in copyright. Right, right, so right. for a while, we had these grandiose visions of touring it. So we put together a few trailers to try to, you know, sell the piece. Um, in the end, that turned out to be a, a much more expensive and difficult uh, project than we could take on and still be making other theater. Um, but so the, the shot that people will see if they stream it, we have, it's a two camera angle shot from the corners of the back of the house. Um, so those, those close up shots, they, they won't see, but they'll at least get two different angles so you can see the action a bit better. So for the trailer, did you just, did you just did, how did you get the close up shots for the trailer? For the trailer, we abused the actors terribly. They were already doing, you know, several shows a night and it, it was a long, uh, rehearsal process because it's a really intense show. And so then one night, men run, we're like, come back to the theater at 11 o'clock and we're gonna film some stuff for a trailer. And they all did, they all came back in and so we could get those close up shots uh, a few times. Wow, you did like pickups for a trailer. I used to do that too when I was in grad school. I would, I would um, during tech, hand a camera to the ASM and be like, just pick actors, pick up actors doing weird things during tech. <laughs> And I'll just like put it in, put it in and make a trailer. So I made a bunch of these like trailers when I was doing shows. In, and I think there are a few different Asia trope too, where it was just like snippets, snippets, cuts, cuts, cuts mm -hmm. of moments. And you play like a little soundtrack to it. Um, oh, I miss those days. <laughs> yeah. I love that show though. I love Sucker Day. That's, that was a show I wrote and directed. Um, but it was a very collaborative process with everybody involved. And I think the biggest collaborator was Anton Chekhov. Because that show is every it's set in a modern day contemporary office space of a failing financial firm, but every line of dialogue is taken from a Chekhov play from over a hundred years ago. So we, you know we just went through all these plays and I just ripped out thousands of lines of text and rearranged them to make a whole new story. A lot of similar themes, um, but yeah. And then it it's one of those plays where it starts very uh, quotidian and ends just crazy. It's absolutely bonkers and that's the sort of stuff that I love to do. Do you think you'll, I mean, when do you think Pony will produce your plays again? I mean, whenever you want to, I suppose is the answer, but like, do you think Mangrove Park is a Pony World play or do you think it's a, an act, I mean, of course we want to be an act theater play, but <laughs> right, like well, how is that relationship now, now, you know, where the Pony World and where you are as a writer, do, will that road converge again? It will at some point, but I actually, I consider my, I consider myself a, a writer of two different types of theater. Wow. One is the kind I do with Pony World, which is more like Suffering Incorporated, which is a, a little more uh, whimsical and bizarre and less grounded in the reality. It, it'll maybe start with a reality that we recognize and then fracture uh, mm -hmm. quite strongly. Whereas the, the playwright I do on my own, I spend a lot more time trying to create a, um, a, a believable reality that can carry us through for longer. And I can really indulge in the sound of the dialogue and the way people interact, which is just a different approach than what we do with, with Pony World. Right. So Mangrove Park, I don't actually know if it would be a Pony World show as we typically do them, or as at least the ones that I've written for Pony World. And I think it's, one of the great things about this workshop and trying to get my work out there is, I think it's really easy for, maybe you feel, well, no, you don't feel this as a director, you do your work all over the country. But as a playwright, I think a lot of times locally people say, oh, well, if, if Brendan wants to write something, he'll just do it at Pony World. And it's just sort of easy to then just see me outside of th that network or biosphere of playwriting in Seattle. So this is a chance to like reaffirm, get back out there and you know, separate from my Pony World work, I actually am a, a writer of other things. Yeah. I would say there is something to, you know, um, right, when you also lead the institution, having 
having multiple artistic identities. I think that's, that's actually really tricky. Um, and I would say, I don't know, it doesn't translate. I mean, maybe it does. I was thinking about like CEOs of corporations, right? And mm -hmm. whether or not the identity of the corporation takes on the identity of the CEO in the way that our theaters do. Um, because oftentimes the programming style of the theater is incumbent on the taste of the of the artistic leader and so often yeah. and then we just make that next leap or oh well if you're writing that play naturally you produce it in your own theater when in fact that's not necessarily true right how and right. i think it's so important like you articulated like to have to be able to express multiple aesthetics or, and multiple um styles of of generating work where one is a an ensemble kind of imaginative non-naturalistic way of making work and one is what i would call i mean i don't know a, the straight play play right, right. That you should do both of those things, like Brendan, the artist, should do both of those things, and yeah. they don't have to be tied to Pony World. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you feel this with Azeotrope because it seems like your programming model is a little bit different. But for Pony World and, and for my relationship within that organization, I feel a, a responsibility not just to express my own artistic uh, drummings, but also to acknowledge that there are other people in this company who have their own artistic vision and their own passions. So, uh, you know, like Sand Hall, who's the other co-managing partner, she directs, she's a fantastic director. So what's the show she wants to do next? The show that we were mid-production for COVID, that was a passion product project for Lisa Vertel, who's a company member who's an actor. She's, she wanted to play that character so bad. So as a, as a, I can't, well, I'm just, but I didn't write or direct it, so we're not gonna do it. No, I have to honor her as an artist too. So. Yeah, I think we, um, there was a moment early on in, in the genesis of Aziotrope's kind of founding where we, we came at a point where there were a number of artists who were interested in becoming company members or associate artists. And um, <laughs> I think the, the little voice in my head that said, no, no, <laughs> I love you, but no. Um, uh, I didn't have the bandwidth and I it was probably just really just at the end of the day just probably too selfish and I was like as it is Richard and I coming to agreements around work is enough I didn't want to I wasn't interested in, in leading by consensus um, and I don't know and, 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 it, and, it, and, it, and it kept us small um, which meant less accountability to other parties which also means less stakeholders, less, right, more work on you, more work, right, at the end of the day, it's more work I have to do, but then at the end of the day, like, the accountability ends with the two of us, and that's it. Um, that's great. And that's no, kind and of continued. <laughs> all those things are true, though, like, you're right, you, the accountability is more focused on you, too, but then it also means that there's more burden on both of you at the same time. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. It's a constant tight rope, tight yeah. rope walk. It is the couch, like number of times, like, oh yeah, rehearsing in my, building the show in my garage, <laughs> rehearsing in my basement, my clothes, Richard's furniture. <laughs> it's like, um, I don't know. And I think that the fact that we still do that kind of scrappy theater and I still have, you know, the freelance side of me still gets to go and, you know, work at other institutions. Um, I feel like doing the up at 4 a.m. painting the set with Aziotrope is what keeps me from taking anyone for granted. Mm. Anyone for granted, you know, um, <laughs> the ASM, the props person, like, remember that, remember that they do this. There's someone, yeah. well, <laughs> hopefully not at 4 a.m., but there's someone who has to paint that damn set, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah as, much as, I, as much as I kind of resent it, I think it's probably good for me that I, we still, we still produce at the level that we do and that really growth is not one of our, like we're not looking to grow in that way. There's no like five, three to five year plan for expanding the budget. And I think in, that can be super limiting. I, and, I, and I get that, that's very limiting. It limits our capacity to make impact. It limits our capacity to do big person shows, like multiple, like big ensemble shows. Um, but I, I don't know, I feel like there's other companies doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. too, so. What is our, we're, we are one of the plankton in the ecosystem of Seattle theater is how I see and it. And a vital plankton. 
<laughs> what are that like photosynthetic cyanobacteria? I don't know. I'm, now I'm throwing out science, fake science words. What I would say bioluminescent. <laughs> when it comes to desert monitoring, bioluminescent for sure. Bioluminescent. Awesome. Cool. Um, it looks like we have a few questions from the audience. Um, am I correct, Gail? Gail, join us with some questions from the audience. I just got a little ping from the chat box. <laughs> yes, we do. But I, you know, it's hard to interrupt you guys because I, I feel like I'm part of your conversation, like a fly on the wall, not to use the fly metaphor at the moment. But um, <laughs> that was so oh, much fun. That, metaphor. <laughs> that was so much fun. But yes, we do. By the way, I'm uh, Gail Bensler. I'm the director of marketing here at ACT. And, you know, John Langs and I were pinging back and forth a couple of minutes ago. You guys were talking about collaboration and you kind of ended the conversation talking about some of the challenges and, and, and how important small theaters are in the community. John has a really good question. He wants to know, you know, a little bit more about collaboration. What's really challenging, but what really gets you going with collaboration? What um, are your favorite parts of collaboration? That's a question to both of you. Better anyone go first or? Oh, um, can I open you would? I'll let you go first. Okay, sure, 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 sure. Um, I, I, okay, so I would, I would preface this by saying that I imagine my definition of collaboration is different from yours because we just, we, we function differently in the process as playwrights and directors, right? Um, so I, I don't, I, I regard my collaborators as designers, dramaturgs, actors. I don't think of a playwright as a collaborator because I feel like I'm always serving the play more than I am. Maybe it might be semantics. I don't know. Um, but I feel like I, I, I function more as a person in service of the, the work the playwright's doing, right? And it's my job to help you get to the thing you want to get to. Whereas, and I, and I say this because one of the things I value in collaboration is dissonance. Dissonance disagreements is what I find incredibly helpful. Um, and and in, in a way that maybe, and maybe I do that with writers too, but I feel like oftentimes is so that, because like I, I will never tell a writer, don't write that, that's not a good thing to write. Don't do that, right? I might say, you might be going about the thing you're writing in a really weird way, but I will help you get there. I never question the there when mm. it's the but if it's a designer, you know, or an actor, like we want to go there. I'm like, tell me why you want to go there, because I want to go there, right? The disagreements about what the there is sometimes comes up, and then I think that's when you really have to be able to defend your choices, show up with your homework, right? Know that I know the play, I've done the work, and this is and this is my logic, my reasoning for why we're going there and not there. Mm -hmm. I don't do that with a writer. With a writer, I kind of go, okay, okay, you want to go there. Let me help you find the right highway to get there. I see what you mean. And I, I think there's, when it comes to the playwright director dynamic or the playwright dramaturg dynamic, maybe it's not collaboration in the same sense that you would have between a director and a designer, a director and an actor. But there's still an element of that in there. You know, I, when I work on a, a workshop and you play development with a director and I'm in the position of being the playwright, th there is no one more helpful to create a new piece than that director. Or like, the, you know, whether you want to use the analogy of the birthing coach or the uh, archaeologist who's digging down to find what the real thing is and, and where it exists, either way, it really couldn't exist without them. Even though it, it maybe it's not that, dis that dissonance you talked about, which is also very important. Like when we work with Pony World, that's, we argue all the time. Yeah, and hopefully it gets us to the right place. Maybe not always, but hopefully. Um, I like. I, I think a, one of my favorite examples of that is when we were doing Suffering Incorporated the first time, back in 2011. Uh, I had written this moment at the end, or towards the end, uh, and it had to do with gun violence in the workplace, because first off, like so much of the play relies up, upon uh, you, uh, a key cultural identifiers about American workplaces. So it seemed, given America, that you couldn't really do that without including, like, we got the cake party, you also have to have the workplace violence, where we are. It's also checkoff, checkoff, there's gonna be a gun, it's checkoff. So it was like, you had to do it, but how to do it 
was the question. And we fought, maybe fight is a little strong, but like I had this thing and everybody kept saying, Brennan, that's not working. And I was like, no, it's gonna work. I was like, Brennan, it's not working. It's really gonna work. And then like finally it, it just, no, it wasn't working. But then what to replace it with? And we went for weeks trying to figure out what it was. And it was funny, like three nights before opening, and I was driving home at two o'clock in the morning from the theater, and I was exhausted and angry. And I was like, that's, that's what it is. And it finally hit me. And the next morning I had to go out and buy 50 new props. We brought them in, we opened in two days. Okay, this is the ending. So exhaustion and anger will yield good art. <laughs> <laughs> exhaustion and anger and people telling you you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I mean, I don't know if you feel this way, but I am very skeptical of yes. Um, because I also know that in a system where I'm the director, no one's going to tell me no, right? No one's going to be like, well, I'm going I'm to tell them, I'm going to get hired again. So I, there's an innate power imbalance in the room when I come in and I have an idea. It's like walking to the room with spinach on your teeth and no one's telling you. And everyone's like, you look great, you look great. And I'm like, you tell me if this is on my teeth, you tell me that, right? But I think we don't, we don't empower actors and, I mean, maybe not so much design, but definitely actors. Actors rarely feel empowered enough to contradict my direction um, because they don't want to be difficult, right? right? They don't want to be like, I don't want to be difficult. And even when they do, even when an actor does, I have never, except for the actor that I'm in a relationship with, my partner's also an actor, I have never had an actor say, okay, they'll say, okay, I don't know, blah, 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 but I'll do whatever you want. It always ends with, but I'll do whatever you want, right? I've mm -hmm. never had an actor say, I don't think this is a good idea, full stop. Mm -hmm. There's always a kind of couching of the, I'll be compliant, I will be cooperative, I will not be difficult. Um, and maybe this, maybe I'm an anomaly when it comes to how I think good, I mean, cause I'm not, I'm not threatened by no, because I know I'm the boss. Like I know that, <laughs> I know I can fire you. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but right, so I feel like if I get to choose, I'm gonna choose anyway. So tell me when it's wrong. So I don't choose the wrong thing or choose the bad thing or choose the unhelpful thing. So that's, that's where I feel like whatever I can do to encourage contradiction in the room, especially when it's something that I, because I, I want to make sure that this thing we're trying to do like passes all the tests. It wants to be scrutinized and checked in yeah. all the ways so that when you, when, right, we, we like, we play tested this moment and it works as opposed to people just naturally saying yes because they don't want to be difficult. And I think that's, that's where it becomes like, it's not about the work then, that's about something else. Yeah. And as I was a playwright, I to oh, sorry, Gail. Oh, no, that's okay. I was going to move on to another question, but Brendan, if you had yeah. something you wanted to add. No, 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 that was fine. It's good. It's good. It's good. No, this is great. You guys, you guys are, are really, really fun to listen to. And I just kind of, we, we've got a question and it kind of sort of jumps off what you guys were just talking about with collaboration. It's the metamorphosis of a play. And Brendan, Generally speaking, what is your approach to polishing a play? You talked a little bit um, with Mangrove Park a little bit ago, um, you know, where things had changed and, and what that process was like. But generally speaking, do you do minor rewrites, major rewrites, something in between? What kind of details are you obsessing over when um, you're in the creative process? Um, I, well, every play is going to be different because uh, every play has different needs and where you are in the process is going to be unique to that experience. But um, I guess, I guess for me, there's no such thing as minor rewrites. Even when I think they're minor, they never end up being minor. Even if I think that the story structure is more or less sound and uh, I just need to go in and tweak, that tweaking ends up being rewriting almost every line of dialogue um, and doing that several times over. But structurally, it can also change because really. the more you do that stuff, the more you are getting intimate with every part of the character, and then you realize, oh no, this needs to change. This it needs to be a whole other motivation for this moment. The more, so maybe you start off by entering it with the small, but then you just submerge deeper and deeper and start tearing it apart from the inside out more and more. And I'm mixing tons of metaphors here, which is a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think 
the the Mangrove Park, for example, oh, it's gone through so many changes. And some of them are really hard to accept. There's there's stuff from like the very first draft that I was really attached to. And I got some feedback from that very first reading. They're like, this this thing you have going with the flashbacks just isn't working. And I for like a year and a half, I was convinced, oh no, it's it's just because uh, reading format, you know, like, audiences couldn't see it, so they, they have to see it. And then I was like, no, this is cut out. Those six whole scenes just gone. You know, they're just they're just not working. You have to sort of just accept that you're doing it wrong. And it's hard to let go of those things that you thought were really important. But as the play changes, what's important changes, you know? Did I babble enough? Was that? No, I think that was, that was really awesome. I, you know, I, I think um, what I'm hearing from, from people right now is that they really got a sense of what it's like to really get into the weeds with the creative process. And I think a lot of people are really interested in that. And I thank both of you for taking the time to talk with us and to give us your insights on directing, playwriting, collaborating, working together, the process. So thank you very much, Des and Brendan. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you for doing this whole thing in the workshop and trial and error and ACT and Des and the whole staff at ACT. Thank you so much. Well, before I let you go, everyone, I wanted to tell you what we have coming up at ACT. Um, first up tomorrow night, get ready for something truly amazing. It's Christina Wong for public office comes to act for one night only. Um, this is an irreverently funny, raucous, timely, interactive um, piece of work from her home to you. Don't miss it. October 16th, tomorrow night, seven o'clock. And then after that, our next act local playwright series conversation comes to you in just two weeks. Thursday, October 29th at 7 p.m., the wonderful Amantane Aurore and Amina Kaplan um, are going to get together and have a conversation that you're not going to want to miss. Uh, they're talking about um, Amantane's new play, The Ever-Expanding Moment. And you can find information, tickets, and more for all of our upcoming programs, including A Christmas Carol, on our website, acttheater.org. And don't forget when you support ACT, you support the arts. Help us continue to bring you the programming you love this year, next year, and into the future. Please donate today. And you know we're just so delighted that you were able to join us. We hope that you had fun having lunch with us today. And on behalf of Brendan, Desdemona, John, and all of us at ACT, we hope you have an amazing afternoon. And we'll see you tomorrow night for Christina Wong for Public Office.